Hello, everybody. Welcome to our monthly series on chronic pain and illness. Uh, before I start, I just want to remind you to turn your cell phones off and to hold questions till the end. So I'm Dr. Lisa Lillianfield. I'm one of uh, four physicians at Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine. And um, we deal with a lot of um, chronic pain and illness. We do, some of us do acupuncture, some do injection therapy. Um, I have a special interest in, um, in hormone therapy um, and acupuncture. And I'm thrilled to, to introduce Dr. Gary Kaplan, who is um, a colleague and friend of 30 years. And he is medical director and founder of Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, he is board certified in pain management, in family medicine, in osteopathic <coughs> medicine, and medical acupuncture. Um, and he has also authored a book called Total Recovery, um, uh, uh, Revolutionary Approaches to Treating Chronic Pain and Depression. So join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Gary Kaplan. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Welcome. Let's do an easy thing first. I need a meditation. Shall we meditate? <laughs> Good. So, if you would please, just kind of gently let your eyes close. <coughs> Feel yourself in the chair. Feel your feet on the ground. Kind of uncross your legs and uncross your arms. And just let them rest gently in your lap. And if you would, start to pay a bit of attention to your breathing. Feel your abdomen soften as you breathe in. Lungs expand. And just feel the breath moving gently in and out. Just kind of take a moment to scan your body. Just kind of look around inside and see if there's any areas of tension or distress. And as you note those areas of tension or distress, just kind of work on breathing into them. Let the breath come into them naturally and easily. And just let the muscles relax, let the tension dissipate with each exhalation. And as you're sitting there breathing easily and just letting a little more tension go with each exhalation, Breathe in, feel the muscles, the chest expand. Feel a little stretch that occurs as you breathe in, and how everything relaxes nicely as you just let the breath go out. And as you're feeling a little more present, a little more centered in the room, take a moment to notice the things that you're grateful for in your life. Family, loved ones, the ability to sit here for a moment and breathe. Spring in Washington, certainly our most magnificent season. And just allow yourself to notice and feel the gratitude for the blessings in your life. And now, just gently start to notice 
your feet on the floor again, weight in your chair, support that the chair provides you in your back. Feel the air in the room a little bit stirring, a little cool. And gently and slowly allow yourself to stretch a little and bring yourself back to the room. And when you're comfortable and ready, allow your eyes to open and be fully present. So welcome. Thank you all for coming out this evening. I am delighted you were here. We have important things to talk about. We're going to start with a problem. We're going to try and redefine the problem. And then hopefully we're going to propose some potential solutions to the problem. The problem is chronic pain. And I'll tell you what got me really inspired on this was two things. One is um, I've been attending some conferences on problems with narcotic abuse in the military and narcotic overuse in the military. Uh, a really severe, horrific problem that's gone on. And the military has decided that its response to this is they need to stop prescribing so many narcotic medications. They didn't decide they needed to actually provide other solutions to the vets who were suffering with the pain. <laughs> they did decide they needed to stop prescribing so many narcotics. And so they're stopping prescribing so many narcotics. Our vets are not doing so well as a consequence. So we have to be careful with when we say we want to fix things, what it is we want to fix. And I was doing an interview with a reporter uh, last week, and I said, you know, the outcome we should be measuring is the health of the patient, not the number of prescriptions we're writing, not the lack of utilization of the facilities. Have we made a difference, a positive difference in the life of the people we're trying to serve, and especially in the case of the vets who so valiantly served us? So there's a horrific problem going on in the military. <clears throat> the second thing that has really got me motivated on this was the American Academy of Pain Management meeting, a pain medicines meeting uh, that was a few weeks ago at the Gaylord. This is the big pain medicine meeting uh, each year. Uh, it's where all, everybody who's anybody in pain comes to speak or to attend to lectures. And um, it's terrifying. I have never seen so many people trying to justify the use of opioids and this address the side effects of what's going on with the opioids. I've never seen so many people trying to justify the ongoing use and abuse of procedures such as selective nerve root blocks and dorsal column stims and fill in the blank if they can stick a needle in and inject it. There is a time and a place for all of these things, but they are grossly, grossly overutilized. Our own data tells us they're overutilized. I sat in one conference with one of the leading experts in the country on, he's an epidemiologist who understands the specifics of uh, selective nerve root blocks and dorsal column stims and all of these different procedures for treatment of uh, neuropathic pain. And he's done a massive literature review looking at all of the studies talking about whether or not these procedures work or not. And the answer is they don't work, not for neuropathic pain. And yet they continue to be utilized on an ongoing basis. There's a problem. It's a great big problem. And we are addressing the problem incorrectly. So how big is the problem? The problem is 100 plus million people. Essentially a third of the country is suffering with chronic pain. Chronic pain is migraines, chronic daily headaches, back pain, neck pain pain associated with discs that go down, goes down your leg. Any pain that has persisted for a period past the expected time of healing. That is essentially chronic pain. So fibromyalgia certainly is chronic pain. So chronic pain, there's lots of faces to chronic pain. So we get a little bit put off when we say chronic pain. I don't have chronic pain, but I do have headaches all the time. I have back pain all the time. OK, I have neuropathy from post neuralgia, fill in the blank. So chronic pain is this great big umbrella, 
but it is very specific to the individual suffering with it. So all of these things are chronic pain. And it's a hell of a cost to the country. North of half a trillion dollars a year is what pain is costing us in this country, between disability, lost wages, and direct patient care. Half a trillion dollars. And as far as disability is concerned, we've got 47 and a half million people reporting disability. And guess what the top two disabilities are? Pain problems. The pain problem in arthritis right. and rheumatism is 8.6 million. Back and spine problems is 7.6 million. Now disability means that you are no longer able to participate in all of the activities that you would like to participate in. And in this particular case, because it's social security disability, these people are on the dole. All right, they can't work. They want to work, but they can't work because the amount of pain they're in doesn't allow them to continue in their profession. So they have to go on disability. Okay, I will tell you, I've been treating chronic pain for 30 years. When I was originally taught in chronic pain was that there were a large number of malingerers, people who were trying to avoid secondary gain, get out of work. All right? There is no question that there is some of those people. It is a very small minority of the people. The people I see in chronic pain do not want to be in pain and would like to be doing something else with their lives other than spending time in my office. And my job is to see if I can get them out of my office because then I'm successful. They don't need me anymore. But this is the problem, all right? So we're talking about 16.2 million people just in the top two areas of disability. We go down to number five, by the way, is headaches. So this more disabled than people with heart disease, more disabled than people with diabetes, which are the next couple on those. Huge, huge problem. The leading cause of disability in the U.S. for patients ages 15 to 44 is, anybody want to guess? Nope. But I set you up for that. <laughs> the leading cause of disability is major depressive disorder in this age group. All right. <clears throat> now, why am I talking about depression when I was just talking about pain? We'll come to that in a sec. But first, you need to know a couple of things. We've got 14.8 million people in any given year suffering with a major depressive disorder. We have 3.3 million people suffering with dysthymia, this chronic low-grade depression. We've got 6.8 million people with generalized anxiety disorder. 7.7 .7 million people with PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. The leading cause of post-traumatic stress syndrome is car accidents. Car accidents. About 80% of people involved in a significant car accident will have symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome for about a year after that accident. Only 20% of those people will persist afterwards. But this business of being hyper alert when you're in the car, being a little bit anxious about getting in the car to go where you want to go, okay? Being anxious around cars in any way, shape, or form as a passenger in a car, okay? Sleep disturbances. A little bit more on edge overall in life. These are symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome. We've got 6 million people who suffer from frank panic disorder. We're talking about 38.6 million people suffering with one of these neuropsychiatric illnesses in any given year. Total cost is $148 billion a year to us. Out of that, depression alone accounts for somewhere between 83 to $100 billion of that cost. Now, it turns out that the comorbidity of a neuropsychiatric disease, depression, generalized anxiety disorder, post-traumatic stress syndrome, and chronic pain are common. So this was a problem we noted a number of years back. Now, you say, okay, fine. If you're in pain all the time, I'd expect you to be depressed. But that's a situational depression and very different from major depressive disorder. Because if I have somebody who is in pain and I wave a wand and make their pain go away, the depression's gone with it. But a very high percentage of people have major depressive disorder and chronic pain. And those people are particularly tough to treat. If we look at the numbers and the overlap, now you'll, you'll notice here that the number of people who have a chronic pain here is different than the first slide I showed you. This is 47 million. It's actually a little bit higher than this from the most recent study. But basically, that's the number of people suffering with fairly significant disabling pain. So these are people who don't have aches and pains every day and are taking Advil or Tylenol periodically. These are people who are seeing their doctor and struggling day to day to get by with their pain problems. 
So if we look at the overlap between that group and major depressive disorder, it turns out that somewhere between 50 to 65 percent overlap. They will have distinct neuropsychiatric diagnoses as well as a chronic pain condition. Now, <clears throat> that accounts for about 15 to 20 million people. If you've got chronic pain and depression together, they have a lower treatment success and much higher cost than when these conditions occur separately. What's the difference? If you have straight chronic pain, that is you don't have depression, you don't have any uh, neuropsychiatric illness, the odds of success are somewhat south of 50%. Not particularly spectacular if you think about it. If you have depression and you don't have chronic pain, again, you're south of 50% but you're 48%, 47%, somewhere in there. The cost of treating individuals suffering with both of these conditions occurring together, chronic pain and depression, runs anywhere from 25 to 50% higher. These numbers are from about four years ago. Uh, we, I don't have any updated numbers because more recent studies haven't come in yet, uh, but I know they're going to be higher. Uh, disability is greater when both these conditions are present. Likelihood of recovery. If you have chronic pain and depression together, your likelihood of recovery is under 10%. We have a problem. 15 to 20 million people suffering with these conditions together, and the likelihood of our being able to get them better is under 10%. I would suggest the problem here is we don't have any idea what we're treating. 